The American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust, because the making matters. Thompson Lay Tools, welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner, for wood turners. Today we're going to make a really neat project. We're working with some red Mallee burl from Australia. Really neat stuff, but ugly as all get out, right? Really cool because burls are like almost a cancer growth on a tree, but they don't hurt the tree. So you can actually see the waviness in the grain. It goes all different directions. So that's what causes all the swirls and these little pops and things like that. The cool thing about it is, here's the money shot. When you turn them, they look like this. That is incredible. I mean, look at the colors, look at the swirling in there. It's just beautiful. I mean, I don't know how to describe it. It's just one of the nicest things nature has hidden for you inside of a tree. And I really have to thank Kay. It's either Saucier, Saucier. I haven't met him in person yet, so I'll call him Kay. But he is the owner of Bad Dog Burls, and he sent me three of the, these burl caps to play with. And I really appreciate that. He's got a lot of stuff to look through on his website, bag, 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 baddogburls.com. Uh, but <laughs> the thing is, is that his prices are pretty reasonable. Some of these things can get extremely expensive. Um, you got to imagine all the trouble people go through to harvest these off trees, put them into containers, you know, preserve them, everything else, ship them from Australia all the way to the United States. There's a lot of cost involved. Um, the cool thing is, is that every burl is different, so you have to figure out what you're going to do. Here's the third burl he sent, and this thing is really unique looking, but it has some inherent problems. If you look at the thickness of it, it's pretty thin right here, bulges out to here. So if I'm trying to make a bowl, imagine, I get, or a dish shape, I don't have a lot of room here. This thing could be about an inch and a half, maybe two inches deep when I'm done. But the payoff would be, is that if you have a bowl in right here, then look at these edges out here, these flying wings you'd wind up with, and the natural edge. Yeah, it'd be really, really cool. Also, it has a lot of opportunity for failure, so that's why I'm gonna do this other one today. <laughs> and this one is a beast. This is a beautiful looking piece of burl. Now, sometimes when they harvest, they have to make a straight cut off the tree right there. And believe it or not, you can harvest these off living trees and it doesn't hurt the tree. Also, a lot of these are harvested off dead trees too. So it, it doesn't really hurt the native trees to take these things. You're just borrowing a piece from them. But anyway, I'm gonna nip this off at the bandsaw right here so I don't have this big knot hanging out here. Make something with that down the line later. And then we'll show you how to mount this on the lathe. Now, one thing I wanna keep in mind is form. If you see, uh, how to explain this? See how deep this is and then how thin it gets here? I want to keep as much of the thin as I can. I don't want to make a cut up into here because then all of a sudden my edge is a rounded edge. If I can kind of just skirt right in here and take this off, then I have a chance of having a more natural looking edge on the bowl when I finish up. So I'll go ahead and start this up and we'll just slowly run it through. <laughs> Come over here and get this wing. There we go. You see the color of the wood there. Now how to hang on to a burl is an interesting thing. The way I want to mount this first is to actually drill a hole in here so I can put a worm screw in here and then hold it on the chuck like so. So later we can make a recess in here after we've turned the bottom to expand this to hold it so we can then do the pretty part. <laughs> well, the thing is, is that, now I gotta admit, 
Whoever's doing the chainsaw work on these is an artist. I mean, this is really nicely done, but it is still bumpy. So I want to drill a hole here and have this suck up to the jaws of the chuck, but I need this surface to be perfectly flat. If it's wobbly or something, I might not get a good hold. So the thing I came up with was I need to drill with a Forstner bit a clearance right there. But where do I put this hole? Well, on this one, when I put the hole in here, there is so much weight out here that I can only turn it about 100 RPM for quite a while because it's so out of round. I want to try to get this one more in round, more balanced, so it'll, it'll circle right. Because what I did on the other one was I simply, I have a bunch of these circles with different sizes, right? And so you just take one of these, put it on here and go, okay, that looks good and I made my center that way. This time I'm going to do it by balance, so <laughs> this, is, this is a little raspy thing that you use on your drill. It's a, a rasp and cuts wood, but it's got this thing on here, which I like the, the shaft. So I'm going to put this right here. Here it comes. <laughs> I'm going to take this. This seems silly. But I'm going to see if I can, whoa, if I can balance this piece of wood on there and just get it to where it's pretty equal on the weight. So I think I'm pretty close. Oops, I <laughs> just moved it. So let's see here. I'm just feeling this with my hands as it wants to go one way or the other. See, it's heavy back right now to me. So I'm going to pull it forward just a little bit. And just take your time with this part right here. Okay, now it's balanced where I want it, right? So I'm putting my finger right where, right where I want the hole to be. So let's see here. I'm mark that right there with a wax pencil. So that's where I want my center to be. So now we're going to take this and I want to do this drill. To mount this on the drill press is impossible because you can't clamp it. So I'm going to do this by hand, which is going to be a little safer. And I'm just going to use these blocks to get this as level as possible because I don't want this to be crooked. So that looks pretty good right, Ugh, right there. That's about symmetrically. Hey, Brian, can you squat? Can you see now how we're looking? <laughs> it's hard on him. <laughs> how are those legs doing? Uh, but anyway, uh, so we'll see what we can do here. Now I'm going to take this really slow because this is a, um, a two and a half inch Forstner bit. My chuck jaws, when, when I put on there, they're going to be a little bit shy of that diameter so they'll fit in the hole that this makes. I don't need a big hole. I just need a little bit, enough of it to get everything flat but it tends to want to jump on you a little bit when you do this. I'm going to go as slowly as possible and hopefully this will work out well. And I want to make sure I'm straight up and down. There we go. That's smoothed out. It doesn't look great, but it's smooth. And you can see there's a little bit of off on it so that's why I did this because now it dipped down a little bit and it's smooth right there so it's going to suck up really nice. Now I need to change out bits because I need to drill a hole for the worm screw to go into. This stuff is so hard that you're going to have to fish around to figure out what size bit to use for your worm screw because normally I use a certain size that did not work on this because it was too, uh, the hole was too tight. Green wood will let you do a smaller hole and the screw will dig in better. But when it's dried wood, you got to be just barely smaller than the, uh, the worm screw to make it grip right or it won't screw on. Okay, now we're ready to go to the lathe. Now for those of you who are new to wood turning, this is what a worm screw looks like. It is uh, double-ended usually, and these are big teeth on here, so they'll bite into the wood. And basically, this part right here, my fingers, is where it goes inside the chuck, and the chuck grabs it. So basically, you just take it in here like so. I'm using the smaller one today. And you start tightening it down and get it to sit in, sit in there right. Now, sometimes, I don't know if you can see this, but see how this moves in and out? Well, you want to pull it out as far as possible and tighten it down there. You don't crush it. If you don't pull it out 
as you screw this on by hand, there's a chance this might slide forward sometime during the turning. So go ahead and pull it out now so it's sticking out. The other thing you have to remember is, is know that measurement out so you know how deep to drill that hole. If you, whoop, I'll get that later. Um, if you have to, if you drill this hole, this hole, <laughs> it's not deep enough. That means that the screw is going to bottom out in there and then your chuck jaws will not touch here. Your chuck jaws have to touch there to give you the support you need. So let's mount this on here. Ow, did I mention these are pokey? Okay, so we'll get this up here. I'll just start spinning this by hand. You can see it starts feeding in. Yeah, I keep going. I don't want to spin the piece of wood just yet because I don't want to screw up the directions going on. Now it looks like it's going okay. Ah, it will set itself in here in a second. It'll straighten up the, let me lock this down. It'll straighten up and touch completely on the surface of the wood. Now you can see we got great contact in there all the way around. So this thing is on there really good. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to start turning on this side. Now remember when I took so much time to balance this? Look at this. This is almost perfectly balanced. One of the, it's still going to wobble when we start it, but that's one of the issues is if it's out of round, which means it's out of balance, uh, it's going to shake any lathe that you have. And this is an 800 pound robust American Beauty and it's not supposed to move at all, but physics, you can't beat physics, so that happens. <laughs> uh, this is definitely a mask project for a little while at least. And I've got my, what is this, half inch? It almost looks like three quarter rough, uh, bowl gouge. <laughs> I'm going to use a bowl gouge throughout this entire process because this grain is so swirly and strange. I need this aggressive tip to just go in there and take little bits of wood at a time. So we're going to start this off really, really slow. So we've got it down to zero, right? Here we go. And I'm going to pick up the speed and you're going to see and hear the vibration here in a second. There it is. Now I'm going to go past that. So you can find a little sweet spot just past the first vibration. Now there's another one there, too much. Bring it back down. So we're going to turn with this. The idea is when you're turning something that has so many voids, so much air, you want to make sure that you have as much speed as possible because you don't want the tool dropping into the hollows. And now as you look at this, we are looking at a shadow and a silhouette. So you want to be very careful when you start approaching this. So I'm going to bring the tool in and just kind of go here a tick. Come back, come back, there we go. You feel the bounce, right? It's going to take a little while before I get to where I have solid wood and I get rid of that bounce. Okay. This is why I'm using the heavy bowl gouge because it absorbs a lot of that vibration. Oh, that's great. We reached solid wood already. Take a little bit less of a cut. There we go. So what I'm going to be doing is starting to work myself around this piece of wood and finding my sides. So I've got that there. The next step I want to do is take the tool rest, move it here, make sure nothing hits, and I'm going to start working my way in here until I get out to the rim. This is going to take patience and time, but once I get it where it's not out around, I can pick the speed way up and we can get into some really look cool looking stuff. So let me get back onto this. So now I'm going to do a push cut, like so. I'm just swinging my body a bit to push that in there. But this is just nibbling away like you do on a regular bowl blank. I don't want to take really long strokes or cuts right now because there's just too much danger <laughs> involved with this. Make sure you keep your arm back too because you can see that wing flying. Well, there's part of it that I can't see because it's a blur. You can actually feel with the bevel of the tool as you come back, so you know where you are. There is no silhouette to really watch here. 
because, like I said, it's half air and half wood. Oh, it's doing great now. Keep in mind, too, what shape you want. <laughs> so you don't take away too much wood because you can't put it back on. And this is just rough cutting right now. So there we go. It's getting into there pretty good. So I'm going to work on this a little while and get myself up to here. I want to make some wings in this one, I think, so it's nice and thin on the ends. So I'll take a little bit of knocking this way to get to that point. bit of a shape on here now. I'm just going a pull cut real quick. I want to clean up that transition. This is where decisions start being made because like I said every burl is different and as I was turning this I thought that was cool and then I went uh oh look at that. That is phenomenal. That really is exciting to me. I don't want to go any deeper than this now because I want to preserve that one thing right there and so I have the shape kind of where I want it but if you start looking at it from this angle now, you can see the rim, right? And I'm going to take some of this off to get it flat here on top. But what this is lending to me, I hope it can work out, is, is that this will be kind of dished. Like a wing is almost going up a little bit. I think that is going to look good. We'll thin this down, but I'm going to keep it fairly thick because I love this look with the natural burl on the edge. I think that's pretty doggone cool. So that's what's so exciting about working with burls. Just something always pops up. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to turn my recessed tenon on this end. And then I also, since this is really thick, I don't have to turn this other side. Normally I will clean up this side while I'm turning a thin one. But because when you turn this around, it gets a little bit off. It's not quite as level. This is going to be so thick you won't notice any imbalance. So I'm going to clean up this cut here and I'll put a tenon in here and then we'll be ready to flip this around. Okay, I'm looking for three inches on this. Um, the expansion distance on these jaws is a minimum of three inches. So I write that down on every one of my jaws. As a matter of fact, I write down <laughs> also the minimum tenon size too. <laughs> so that way I can remember what I need to do each time. People make jigs up for um, setting this. You know, have a piece of wood they can hold up every time. I just have yet to get around to it yet. Been looking for that elusive round to it for years. Anyway, uh, I'm to the point I want to transfer that mark onto here. So we'll turn this back on. There we go. I have a sharp point and a dull point. That's my sharp point. So we keep this point away. And touch this. Okay, not enough. One more. There we go. Hang on. There we go. Okay, let me stop it. And you can see it's better. So now this point is touching there. You can see it goes... <laughs> stop! Quit moving! This goes all the way over there. So now I'm going to hollow this out. I know how wide to make my tenon. So I'm going to make it a little bit wider than that because obviously three inches is, is exactly how wide you can make it. So I don't want it to be too small on that. Anyway, I'm looking for a couple toys here. I'm going to go with a smaller bowl gouge now and just remove some wood because I want to go about three-eighths of an inch deep. I want a good hold with this one. Let's see if I can pick the speed up too. Oops, wrong button. Woo! That's a little shaky, but that looks good. <laughs> it's talking to me. Here we go. You want to just take your time because the feet per second here are pretty slow. Woo! Just about lost all my tools. I'm gonna slow this. Brian, look at this. Show the shake. <laughs> That's how much vibration you can get in something like this. So let's just take that down a little bit. There we go. So the tools have stopped moving. They're not gonna go and fall off and go through Brian's foot. 
that's a bad thing when that happens, you know. <laughs> Insurance, things like that, and then he just whines all the time. <clears throat> anyway, so we'll go back to cutting this out. So I have to go a little bit slower. <laughs> just to save his foot. Jeez. So I just keep rotating this in, it's like cutting a bowl. So I'm coming up to that line, right there. So now, I'm going to stop this because this is one project where I don't want to move the tool rest while things are moving. Not a good idea. So let's see here, this is my little tenon tool that I made a while back. I'm still playing with it, I don't know if I signed off on it completely. But we're going to put in our recess there for our tenon. A little dovetail. So this just goes in flat, and you push. And in again. Can't take the whole cut at once. So there, I've got my angle now going for the tenon. And I'm able to come across with this and start scraping a bit. And clean up the bottom. This is such hard wood, you want to leave the best tool finish you can on it because it's really hard to sand out any imperfections. Get the uh, shavings out of the way there. Okay, looking good. So I'm just going to clean this up. Then I'll sand it, and we'll be ready to turn around and start hollowing out the top side. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no machine gun. But anyway, uh, we do need to sand, so I'm going to take power to help me out. I got a two inch disc on here with a sanding pad so it flexes a bit. Remember, you got air here, so you're going to be kind of riding this carefully as you sand it. There will be a point, I guarantee you, where you're going to have to stop it and do this by hand just to help smooth things out because you're going to miss little areas because you don't want to push so hard that you get caught up into here. The other thing is breathing protection. I have my filter running in the background. You can't hear it, but it's nice and quiet. And then I need my face mask again. One thing um, I want to tell you about this. I've heard a couple bad stories about people who are turning things like this, not necessarily burls, but also just crappy wood. When you have something this unusual, the last thing you ever want to do is while it's spinning, lean over it to check your silhouette. Stop the lathe then look at it. If you lean over here and something lets loose, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Brian knows this, that's why he's over there all the time. Anything flies off, it's not going to hit him. <laughs> Gotta learn that the hard way from one of my earlier shows. Anyway, uh, so let's get this going. Get the breathing protection back on. Brian says I look like a creature from Pulp Fiction or a character, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Turn this on, and actually we're at a slow speed so I don't have to change it very much. So we're just going to come in here, put this into my hip a bit, so I have a little steadiness with it, and start going like so. Now, the tricky thing is when you want to come out to the lip, you just got to come out and kiss it. I know that sounds weird, but it's just a light touch. And then move your body back and forth like this, so you don't want to dive into that. I also have this tilted like this, so I'm contacting down in here. Never like that or he'll catch it and pull it over. Now, I've been working on this for a while and when you're doing the rims, the wings, you want to be careful about a couple, well things, <laughs> duct tape by the way. This stuff when it comes off is so hot and so sharp, I had to put something on here to keep from cutting my skin. It really is that bad, but I don't want to wear a glove. And I don't want to wrap this around my finger, so if this gets caught, it's just going to pull off my hand. But anyway, so I'm coming in here, and I'm feeling for the wood to tick. And when I feel the tick, then I can start entering this cut and going in. Let me start up, I'll show you. So, if you look right now at the tip of this, there's no wood there, is there, right? Well, listen. Famous last words. There's wood out to here. So you've got to come back this far. Hear it? And just ease your way in. Once you get your cut going. 
and just keep going in. Come back and reestablish that, get better cut. What you don't want to do is take a big piece at once. There we go. It's chattery, it's dusty. And you can see how it's hitting my finger while I put the duct tape there. It gets hot. But anyway, what I'm going to do is keep working this back to where this is all the way touching, all the way around. And you can see I've got it where I want it. I'm going to work this back and then we'll be making a bead and putting the bowl shape into the bottom of this. Now I'm making a couple light passes here with a negative rake scraper to clean up the wing. This is the only thing you can use on here except for maybe a skew. So I'm just trying to get that surface as clean as possible for sanding. You can see now I've also started shaping, starting the bowl area. I've got a large bead here. I think it's going to work pretty good. Um, let me turn my light off. It's a little bright there for you. That's better. <laughs> Weird thing is, is I need it, but the camera doesn't. <laughs> so I'm going to take a three-point tool and basically three points on it, three sides. It's just a cool thing. You bring it in straight, touch the edge, and you can make a bead with it. You just have to be careful. You don't dig that point in too much. So I'm just going to use this to shape the bead. I'm just scraping away. The nice thing about the point though too is you can make a nice sharp intersection of wherever you're going. So I just keep scraping this away like so and around my edge. So I've got half my bead done right there. I could use a spindle gouge for this but this works so well why not do it. This is like I said on center and flat. You don't want to do that. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> But that's why you watch me, because you can't learn from perfect. And believe me, you must be learning an awful lot from me then. <laughs> you can see it takes my favorite thing, little whispers of wood. And you just pull yourself back and you make that neat little bead. I mean, this is really pretty much ready for prime time right there. So I figured I'd leave the bead large because this is a much bigger piece of wood. That's kind of cool. I might refine the shape just a little bit, and then I'm going to go in here and we're going to dish it out. As you can tell by the sound, I've significantly picked up the speed now. And I've also made sure that I sharpen my bowl gouge so I get a nice clean cut. And make sure I completely cover Brian with shavings. <laughs> push it on through. I want to leave a little lip up here. Keep moving it through. Don't want to take too big of a cut, so I'll back off a little bit there. There we go. If you notice, you'll see these little dark lines. That's from this part of the tool hitting the wood as I push. So it doesn't have a curve to it. So it's always going to rub. But I have a fix for that. Without having to regrind my tool, I'll just go to a different tool. It's like it's snowing Australian burl in here, isn't it? <laughs> we got one last pass on this. There we go. Now. I'm going to stop this because I don't want to do this by while it's moving. I want to raise this up a little bit so when I put this up here, I'm on center, just like that. You can see I refined my bead a bit. I have a little shelf there, so it's kind of looking pretty. Anyway, this is a negative rake again with that up on top. So it allows me to come in here like so and just make some really nice passes. This is a big, heavy Thompson tool. This is a thick piece of steel, and I need it because I need it to take all the shock and absorb everything. I'm sticking the tool way out over there, and I don't have any vibration. So I'm just going to worry this down a little bit. 
Then I will sand everything. You see those black marks are gone now? I'm gonna sand everything and we'll be ready to put a finish on it. Well, it looks like I've dressed it up a bit, right? I've actually taken some painter's tape to cover the bead because when I start using this, I don't wanna run into the bead and destroy that shape. And then once I've done sanding this, I'll actually take tape and go around here so when I sand the bead, I don't put any marks back onto here. And then I can sand the center. But same thing we did before. Just bring the speed up nice and slow. And then have your helmet fall down off your head. There we go, okay. And you have your breathing protection on. And it really helps if you plug the thing in. Okay, hang on. There we go. Much better. <laughs> We're getting ready to put a finish on and oh crap. Ah! Yeah, I forgot I had hair on my hand. <laughs> on the top, not on the palm. <clears throat> anyway. Ah. So after that much hard work, you obviously want to have a little fun. No, that's my new uh, fun thing I found for putting finish in. This is Watco Danish oil. And this is the smallest solo cup I could ever find. It's cool, huh? Anyway, this is where it all pays off, everything we did. First, let me show you. Got a little dust on here, but it's gonna come off. This is the oil I'm putting on. So you got the rim, you got a little detail on the edge, you got the shelf going in. Check the bottom out. Now, is that cool or what? It's got the sap wood with some of the dark wood coming through. I think it's really cool. Brian said it looks like dog paws, and I think he's right. We might have named this one after my buddy Baron, our shop dog. But anyway, so you just have fun now. You basically just load this thing up. With Watco Danish oil, you put on a nice coat, cover everything. Look at that wood. Oh my God, this is like wood turner's porn right now, guys. Enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a cigarette afterwards. <laughs> but anyway, with the Watco Danish oil, you put it on here, leave it sit for 30 minutes. Then you rub it off and you put on a second coat. So I guess the terms Wood turners, porn, and rubbing don't really need to go together, do they, guys? Okay, and gals, well, whoever's out there. So anyway, that is what this is gonna look like. So once we have two coats, it'll look like this one over here, and this one's gonna get a wax coat, which will brighten up again. But anyway, that is how you make a winged bowl out of a red Mally Australian burl. And I do wanna thank the guys over at Bad Dog Burls for sending these, us these burls. I'll have their link down in the information below the video. So anyway, that's the way you do it. So until the next time on Wood Turning, keep turning. The American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust. Because the making matters. Thompson Lathe Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner for wood turners.